Praise the Lord, my soul, with all our enemies. Praise the Lord, my soul, praise the Lord, my soul. He 
satisfies our desires and needs. Praise the Lord. Would you join your hearts and minds with me in prayer? All glorious God, we give you thanks. In your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You chose us before the world was made to be your holy people without, without fault in your sight. You adopted us as your children in Christ. You have set us free by his blood. You have forgiven our sins. You have made known to us your secret purpose, to bring heaven and earth into unity in Christ. You have given us your Holy Spirit, the seal and pledge of our inheritance. All praise and glory be yours, O God, for the richness of your grace, for the splendor of your gifts, the wonder of your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Bishop here at the Rochester Christian Reformed Church. I also want to welcome all of those who are viewing and worshiping from home. We're so glad you've come together to praise our God. And as we enter God's house to praise him, we receive his blessing, his welcome, his hospitality. So receive now his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people proclaimed, Amen. Amen. Welcome to the worship of the Lord. Please be seated. Our call to confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have heard what was written about Jesus in Scripture, how he would suffer and die and then rise from the dead on the third day, how through his death and resurrection, the forgiveness of sin is now possible for all who repent. Remembering this, let us now confess our sins to God, trusting Christ as our Savior and Lord. God of all grace, we are weak and forgetful people, easily distracted by the joys and sorrows of our lives. We are capable of great thoughts concerning you one moment, yet we forget your kindness and live as though we had no hope the next. Forgive us, gracious God, for the unbelief that clings to our sinful flesh and clouds our minds with doubt and fear. Holy Spirit, produce in us faith that we may live in Christ. May all our desires rest in him constantly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now our assurance of pardon. Hear the words of assurance from Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesian church. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory. So hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thank you, Jeff, for leading us. Our scripture reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, and then also John, verses, verse, sorry, chapter 15, verse 16. Before we read the scripture and hear from the Lord, let us pray for his blessing. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, triune God, the God who lives in love and community, we ask you to build us up as a community to build us as living stones in the temple that is your church. Do that work through your word and through the power of your spirit, which attends it. We ask that you would help us to grow, grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Do this work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask 
in my name. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Tuesday is the big day, isn't it? It's election day, and all of us are very much aware of it, more so, I think, than ever before. And of course, elections are about making choices. You choose one candidate, and then you choose not to choose the other one. Whether you voted by mail, voted early, or are placing your vote in person on election day, you have made or you will make a choice. Elections are about choices. Well, God also makes choices, and our text this morning tells us about one such choice made long ago. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Just as he, that is God the Father, chose us, the church, his people, in Christ before the foundation of the world. Way back before the Big Bang, God made a big choice, a choice to save his people in and through the work of Jesus Christ. God made a choice. And we call that choice in the Reformed faith election, appropriately so. We call it election. And in addition to this being the Lord's Day before the election, it is also Reformation Sunday. A day when we reflect on the important doctrines of the Reformed faith. And one of the most precious and most important of those doctrines is this doctrine of election. It resides at the heart of historic Calvinism. But it's also ecumenical enough to be part of the Anglican 39 Articles, the London Baptist Confession, the Savoy Declaration of the Congregationalists, and even makes its way into the Lutheran Confessions. It is a Reformed doctrine, to be sure, but it is also a Reformation doctrine. And this morning, I just want to take some time to reflect on that doctrine, to reflect on God's election, to reflect on His choice to the extent of my finite knowledge, which is indeed quite finite, and what the Bible teaches us about how God made that choice, how He made His election choice. So three points this morning about how God chose, how he made that big decision, that election that's described to us in Ephesians and our text this morning. Point number one, first, God chose his people unfairly. God chose his people unfairly. Now before you uh, send your letter to counsel uh, questioning my orthodoxy, let me explain what I mean, because it would strike you that how can God, who is perfectly just, do anything that's unfair? Well, let me explain. Let me do so using an illustration that Michael Horton uses in his book uh, for Calvinism. He gives this illustration. How would you feel if you had been a loyal employee in the same company for 30 years and some kid fresh out of college was given the same pay, title, and retirement as you? How would you feel? If that happened to you in your workplace, well, you know how you feel. You feel that that was unfair, patently unfair. You would go and you would complain about it, and rightly so. He gives another example. Or what if your younger brother or sister wasted the family's inheritance on wine, women, and song, and your father welcomed him home with a party and the same status in the house as you? How would you feel about that? I'm guessing you would also think that that's unfair. Of course, as you probably have already gathered, these are illustrations drawn from two of Jesus' most prominent parables. One is the laborers in the vineyard, right? God there is depicted as a landowner who hires a series of laborers throughout the day. And at the end of the day, when he pays them, he pays those who worked only a little bit, the same amount as those who labored all day long. And guess what they thought? They thought it was unfair, as we would as well. And then the other one, of course, is the most famous parable of all, likely. That is the parable of the prodigal son, where this one son goes out and uh, squanders his father's inheritance, tells his father he's basically dead, and you know he comes back home, and the older brother, the one who has followed all the rules, his, who has loved and served his father, who has worked so well, he's there too, and he sees this one who has squandered and destroyed his father's reputation, being received back and celebrated, while he, the other older brother, is admonished 
admonish. That does not seem fair. From our perspective, it's entirely unfair. Both of those parables, and that's the whole point. You see, when we make our choices in life, we make them based on merit. We make them based on earning something. We try to have this perceived fairness in our decision-making. We condition our choices on some type of performance, even in the election, right? When you go to vote for somebody, I hope you think about what that person stands for, what he or she is about, that he or she has to earn your vote. You base it on some type of standard, some type of qualification. We do that with everything else. We make our choices for career, for college, for spouse. We look for certain qualities. We base them on certain conditions. We do this because we think it's fair. But when God made his choice, he did not play by our rules. Instead, he chose on our standards entirely unfairly. And in the Reformed tradition, we call this unconditional election, that there is no condition for our election. There was nothing special that qualified us for this choice. Nothing meritorious in us. And the Reformed confessions, particularly the canons of Dort, uh, this is expressed the, under Article 7, election, under the first main point of doctrine. Those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than the others, but lay with them in the common misery. Nothing better. And then even they went so far to say, not even your faith, not even your exercise of faith, your embracing of the truth of the gospel, that isn't even what merited you this choice. Article 9, the same election took place not on the basis of foreseen faith, of the obedience of faith, of holiness, or of any other good quality and disposition as though it were based on a prerequisite cause or condition in the person to be chosen. You get the point. God chose unfairly. He chose unconditionally. And it's not just in the Reformed Confessions. It's in Scripture. Go back to the greatest example of election in the Old Testament. It is the people of Israel themselves and their right to possess the promised land, to be God's special chosen people. And what does God tell them in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4 and 6? He says this to them. When the Lord your God thrusts them out before you, do not say to yourself, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to occupy this land. It is rather because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. Know then that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to occupy because of your righteousness. You are a stubborn people. And of course, here in the New Testament, in the passage I just read to you from Ephesians, it can't be any more clear or explicit. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he chose us, as he elected us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. Not because we are or were foreseen to be, to because he did that before time in love. And then it concludes, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Why? On what basis? According to the good pleasure of his will. And that seems entirely unfair to us in this world. And just as those laborers questioned the landowner, how can you do this? What right do you have to just treat people this way in any way that you think is appropriate? And God, the landowner, replies in Matthew 20, verse 15 and 16, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. What does God say to them? He says, tough noogies, right? You don't like the way I run my show? Tough. I have a right to be generous. I have a right to choose based on what I desire to be chosen. Not because there's any good in you. We can't even enter the mystery of God's will to understand why and how he chose. All that we know is that he chose, first of all, unfairly. Unfairly. Unconditionally. And thank God he did. Because you know what the wages are, right? <laughs> You know what fair wages are, according to the Bible. The wages of sin is death, but God chose to give life through Christ to those he called, those he chose before the foundation of the world. He did it entirely, unfairly, unconditionally. Second, 
The second way God chose his people is purposefully. God chose his people purposefully. Once again, let me try to illustrate this point, this time from Richard Mao. He gives this illustration in his book, Calvinism in the Las Vegas Airport. Here's the point I'm trying to make. He writes, suppose a person is elected to be president of the United States, and excuse the, the all-male gender here, um, this is in his quote, suppose a person is elected to be president of the United States and then spends the first year of his presidency talking a lot about the fact that he has been elected. In his talks to the nation, he tells us how thrilled he is that he, of all the people who might have chosen, we had chosen for the job, was elected to the office of president. He commissioned studies to find out exactly how he got elected. He regularly thanks those citizens who cast their vote for him. He also talks much about his predecessors, people before him, who had been elected to the presidency, and tells us how privileged he considers himself to be counted in the company of such a distinguished group of elected officials. Surely there would come a point where we would all urge him to think about an important question he seems to be ignoring. What were you elected for? What did we elect you to do? You see, that's very true about election. Election in the church, election, this doctrine of election, isn't there so you can gaze at it with admiration and think how wonderful it is that you're in church this morning, that you are presuming that God has called you out of the world, and you kind of stare at it as some type of edifice. It's not meant for that purpose. Election isn't meant to kind of navel gaze. It's, it, it's really a kick in the pants to us. It's calling us to be something. It's calling us to do something. God elected us to something. He has a purpose in it. And that purpose he kind of expresses, right, in that text this morning. To be holy and blameless before him. He has called us to be holy and blameless before him. And yes, he shapes us in that through his spirit, through his work within us. It is a work of God, but it should be an ongoing project in our lives. We should be producing fruit. 1 Peter 2.9 is another place. But you are a chosen race. Here's our election. A royal priesthood. This is speaking of the church. A holy nation. God's own people. In order that. In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What is election for? What are you called to? To go and show forth the glory of God. To proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you, who chose you, who elected you. To go and show the world, be the light of the world. The doctrine of election reminds us that God elected us to something, to be something. Now, I am sick and tired of the media portraying Christians as shallow-minded and uncaring about this world. But I'm even more sick and tired of Christians behaving in ways that justify that caricature of our faith. God has called us to be something. And maybe this election week, instead of thinking about the election that we're having, we should think about our election and our role. Because what makes a country great, what produces justice, is each and every one of us living as God has called us to be. Doing biblical justice in small ways every day. Taking on every square inch of creation in that inquiry for the glory of Christ. Evangelizing. And evangelize, I know it's a scary word, but all it simply means is to be bearers of good news. And in this world right now, wouldn't it be nice to receive some good news? Some good news, the good news of God. God has called us for a purpose. A second thing we know about the doctrine of election is that God chose his people purposefully. Unfairly, unconditionally, purposefully. And number three this morning, God chose his people relationally. Relationally. And again, let me illustrate my point. Recently, the topic of adoption particularly transracial and transcultural adoption, entered into our national consciousness. This occurred, of course, uh, through the nomination, the confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Justice Amy Coney Barrett. And the issue uh, came to the forefront of our national consciousness was this issue uh, about her adoption of two uh, children from Haiti. 
And the accusations began to fly. And of course, as an adoptive parent, I and many other adoptive parents were kind of watching with uh, piqued interest, you know, eating the popcorn. What's this going to happen? What's going to happen here? You know, how's this going to play out? And the accusations began to fly and the debate became heated. Does transracial, transcultural adoption make you a white colonizer? Does transracial, transcultural adoption mean you are inherently anti-racist? No. Or implicitly racist? I certainly hope that's not the case. And so all that stuff was buzzing around uh, Twitter and all that kind of stuff. And mercifully, it did not last long. It died down rather quickly before it got too ugly. But the reason this debate could have been had at all, the reason why it was a debate, was because adoption reflects a choice. It reflects a choice, a choice to make a family in a different way than through biology. If Amy Coney Barrett had married a Haitian husband and had biological children of color, no one would be asking any questions at all, of course. It's because it was an adoption. It was a choice, an active choice, a relational choice that she made and her husband made in their lives. And when God chose his people before the foundation of the world, he made that type of choice, a relational choice. Paul the Apostle, when he's trying to express this to us, like what is this choice about? What does it mean? The best analogy he could come up with in his world to explain it to people like you and me is that human's experience of adoption. Paul found that analogy of adoption. He destined us for adoption, Paul says in Ephesians 1.5, as his children through Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to understand what this choice is about that God made, here's how to understand it. Think about the choice of adoption. God's choice of his people was relational. It was adoptive. He chose to make us his children, to add us to his family. There's an interesting uh, translation issue in uh, Ephesians 1, 4 and 1, 5. It's probably not interesting to you, but it's interesting to me. So it's this, it's this issue about punctuation and where those two little words, in love, should go. In love. And one option is you put them at the end of verse 4. This is what you see in our text in the New Revised Standard Version. And so it makes it a reference to God choosing us in love before the foundation of the world. But other translations put that in love in the very beginning of verse number 5. In love, he destined us for adoption. They relate the love to the adoptive choice particularly. Now, there's a whole lot of debate. Scholars are divided. Um, but as Kyle Snodgrass rightly notes, either rendering is true. God did choose us in love, and he did adopt us in love. It was an expression of his sovereign, all-encompassing, unconditional relational love. God adopted us. He chose us because he wanted us to be part of his family. He wanted us to be one of his children, to be adopted into his family. That's the way God chose love. On September 30th, Satara Rodin wrote an article in Christianity Today. She's, uh, she was adopted from India. And she wrote in response to all the kind of hubbub and controversy around Amy Coney Barrett's adoptive choice. And she wrote this in Christianity Today. In 2001, I was adopted at a young age from a Christian orphanage in Hyderabad, India. The family that adopted me, my family, lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As you might be able to guess, they are white. My adoptive mother traveled across the world by herself to make me a part of her family. I think that's an act of love, that someone wanted me bad enough to seek me out. I didn't just happen to be part of my family. I was chosen. In those words about human adoption, a human adoption, a human choice, we find, beloved, the beauty, the comfort the assurance of the Reformed doctrine of election. If you want to know what this doctrine is about, it's that right there. It's that loving choice. God's choice was an act of love. He wanted you bad enough that he sought you out. You didn't just happen to be part of God's family. You were chosen to be. 
on God's election day, it was all about love. If only we could live our lives that way. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you and praise you for your love, for calling people out of this world to serve you and to love you. And Lord, help us to embrace that calling, to embrace it, to make our calling and election sure by living as you have called us to live, by being whom you've called us to be. Shape us by your spirit and your word that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to live, live in the love of election, to be representative of the love that is present in your family. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we are entering a week of anxiety and concern, I do want to have a time of prayer for our nation. I want to also thank everyone and those at home as well for all the wonderful um, cards and encouragement that you have sent my way. It's greatly strengthening me. Thank you so much to all of you who took time to, to do that. I also um, want to be praying for people. We've had people who've had surgery this past week. We have some uh, who are going in even tomorrow for that purpose. As you know, we're uh, broadcasting live stream this morning, so I'm not going to mention names, but do you you know um, who some of those folks are? One of them is a pretty good uh, pitcher for our softball team. So uh, pray, pray for that, uh, that guy. And, um, but let's now take a moment to pray for our nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, great and triune God, ruler of the nations, we seek you in prayer this morning for the nations of the world, for those suffering famine and civil war, for those nations who are impoverished, for all nations wrestling with the impact of the virus. We lift before you this morning, particularly France and the United Kingdom. We pray that righteousness would flourish in these nations, that healing would come to them. O oh Lord, we pray this morning for our own nation. We have so much to be grateful for. Our history is filled with great acts of righteousness, but also with sins that have brought a reproach to our people. This coming week is a significant week for our nation. Many are forecasting chaos, delay, confusion, and even violence surrounding our election. We pray, we beg of you, Lord, that that will not be the case. We pray that by the next Lord's Day, we will indeed know definitively who our next president is. We pray that there will be widespread acceptance of the legit legitimacy of the result, particularly from the candidates themselves. Many seek to profit from chaos and violence. Many seek to divide us. And some just like to see the world burn. We pray that all those for whom violence is the means to power, that they would be caught in the net of their own wicked plans. O oh Lord, we pray this morning for our nation. We pray for better days. We pray for a victory over the virus. We pray for all those who labor to succumb it, and for those who labor, labor to heal people of it. We pray for better days ahead, for better discourse, for better behavior from each and every one of us. Let us heed your words. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offertory this morning comes from Psalm 67, and just as a reminder, it is World Hunger Sunday, and if you are making an offer this, offering this morning, a special offering, that's where it will go. Uh, Peter Fish, if you have them, you can return them this morning, or you can return them next week. Uh, hear now this reminder of the goodness of God and what he has given us. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of earth 
revere Him. And now we continue to give thanks to the celebration of communion. What a privilege we have of worshiping together even in these circumstances. And the message of encouragement that we heard this morning. Thank you, Pastor. One evening, Jesus asked two of his disciples to prepare a certain room for their celebration of Passover. Here's what the Bible says in Luke 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Well, where do you want us to prepare it, they asked. And he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. At the time when we have communion, or our Passover, we remember what Jesus did for us. Jesus, on the night that he would be betrayed, knew that he would be denied that night by one of his disciples, that he would be abandoned by one of his disciples, and that he would all, lose all his closest friends. They would all leave him. And Jesus knew that he had come because sin needed to be punished. And there was no one without sin who could take that punishment as it was established by God. Jesus would suffer punishment for the whole world. What anguish. In fact, when we read that part in the Garden of Gethsemane where he is so anxious that the perspiration of his face is droplets of blood, we can really understand that he was fully human. He was anxious, and he even said to his father, Father, if you can, if you can just let, let this pass by, them, please. But your will be done. What love and what obedience. That night, suffering all that anguish of what he was going to suffer later on that very week, because he knew what was coming. Jesus took a white wash basin, filled it with water, got a towel, got on his knees, and started washing feet. The feet of his disciples. Peter's feet, who was going to deny him. Judas's feet, who, who had planned and got paid to betray him. And all the other disciples, at that last moment, they would all disappear. But he came to be a servant for us because that's how his father and he had brought this wonderful solution that would allow us, if we believe, to live an eternal life with him. And he said to his disciples, I have set you an example that, what, that you should do what I have done for you. 
So he focused them on becoming kingdom servants. I imagine he even mentioned that for us. So the way that they celebrated the Passover that night, we are going to do the same thing. Jesus took the bread of the Passover, and when he had broken off a piece, he started passing it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the wine that was prepared for the Passover, and he said, this is a source of my blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. Drink from it. As you have been shown and given the gift of how to do your communion, would you please take out the bread now and eat the bread of Passover? And would you take the symbol of the wine and drink it as well? Because having used these symbols, Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you pre proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Eat, he said, because everything has been prepared and we have already done that. Jesus did this for you and for me. It is the saddest thing to think about, all the stuff that we have done that caused his agony and his suffering. Jesus took our punishment. And so we can say with joy, we are forgiven. And we, we can't even understand such amazing grace. But we're going to sing that amazing grace to celebrate our thanksgiving for what he did for us and for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And there are people we don't like in this world, but he came for, for all who believe in him to be his sons and daughters and his instruments for peace wherever he is placing us. Let's sing Amazing Grace. It is.
And forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He, dream, he redeems your life from the pet and crowns you with love and compassion. Let's pray. Wonderful God, thank you for making forgiveness possible through your son. Thank you, Jesus, for taking that suffering so that we could be forgiven and redeemed. Thank you for your willingness to do that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us now, for helping us to become what we have been graced to be. And we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for in your names we live and move and have our being. Amen. You would remain standing for the benediction after, um, if you'd be seated, we'll dismiss row by rows. But even before we begin to dismiss, I, I have a brief announcement this morning that I'd like to make and, um, after the benediction. So receive now God's blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now and evermore. Amen. Please be seated. Pastor T, would you... Come up. So I have an announcement this morning that in many ways is a, is a big deal and in many ways is not. As Tina and I have been talking over the past uh, few four or five weeks here about this, um, I wanted to share with you a transition that will be happening here at RCRC. At the end of this year, Pastor Tina will be transitioning into uh, what's called emeritus status. And that means that she will continue to retain all the privileges of an officer of the minister of the word and will continue to minister among us in very similar ways as in the past. It will mean that she will no longer be an official member of the church's paid staff. Pastor Tinica will be reimbursed by the church for the many expenses she does incur in her ministry of care for people and her ministry among us. This transition will allow Pastor Tinica to minister as much as she desires without the pressures or expectations that accompany being a part of the formal staff. Her ministry among us will not be ending. She is grateful for the, for the support and encouragement of our congregation over many, many years. Please do share your thanksgiving for how God has used her in your life. We are looking forward to many more years of Pastor Tinica being involved in caring for God's people here at RCRC and many more years of her leading us in various aspects of the worship service as she has done this morning, will be doing next week. Uh, her community ministry will continue, God willing, 
and she expresses much gratitude for our church family support and caring. This is not a conclusion. This is a continuation, and it is a transition. And it's a special time for us to reflect upon God's gift. So let, will you join me in prayer this morning for the gift we have received here in this person standing next to me? Oh Lord, your word tells us that pastors and teachers are gifts from you to your church. Sometimes that proves true in our experience. Sometimes it does not. In the case of Pastor Tinica, it has proved true. We have all experienced that gift, even my own family, even me. We give thanks to you for her. Father, please bless Pastor Tinica's continuing ministry among us as she makes this transition. May you liberate her and reinvigorate her for continued service. And may we here at RCRC continue to be blessed by the gift of her ministry among us. We thank you for the gift of Pastor Tinica. In your name we pray. Amen. So please be seated. We'll dismiss you row by row. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. We hope you were blessed by this time of worship and praise, and we hope you'll join us again. 
If you'd like to learn more about Rochester Christian Reformed Church, visit our website at rochestercrc.org. We'd love to get to know you. Thank you again, and may God bless you this week.